So my name is Dominic Wilcox, and I, as was just mentioned, I, I work between art and design and technology and craft. So I don't really, I've never felt that I fit into any particular path. I've sort of created my own path in life, and that is really a, um, me trying to think of ideas that I think are surprising or thought-provoking or interesting, and then making um, the most interesting ones into real objects or communicating them through drawings. So, and, um, so this is me in my studio in London in a forest, uh, sit, and I sit up there with a, a pen and a, a, a sketchbook and a cup of tea, I do like a cup of tea, and I'm trying to, trying to get my mind out of the craziness of London. It's not as crazy as here uh, on the streets, <laughs> but it's, it's busy, you know, and it's difficult to concentrate when, when, it's, when it's chaos. <laughs> um, so this is me getting out of that into a tree for a bit of peace and quiet. And um, this is me when I was a little boy. Uh, that's my first computer. That's an Amstrad CPC 6128, 128K. Amazing. Uh, we talk in megabytes. Maybe no one even knows what K means now. <laughs> but, uh, and uh, my first little funny hat. And I was perfectly normal as a child. And um, I was average academically. Um, I got C grades all the way through. Uh, I was quite good at art and, and maths and physics for some reason. And, and actually, uh, thinking about it, to be a designer, it, in many ways, you have to have the creative side, but also a logical side. And the two come together. Um, you've got, your mind has got to be in many different places at the same time. And um, so I was okay at art at school. I'd draw, I'd draw paint, you know, paint paintings, and we'd be asked to bring things in, um, objects to, to paint them. And I was quite good. I was about third best in the class. Um, Brendan Ferguson was better than me, but um, but but where is Brendan now? Uh, well, actually. <laughs> Uh, he's actually a successful architect, damn. Uh, <laughs> and, but, I, yeah, so that's all I knew about creativity, was just representing things, but I don't think that was really creative. That was a skill uh, of painting. And it wasn't until I went onto an art and design foundation course at Sunderland University, so my accent is from the northeast of England, uh, but I live in London. And uh, first time in India, um, very happy to be here. Um, and this man here, this is the only photograph I could find on the internet. That's why it's the most pixelated image you'll see uh, today. This is, um, this is high resolution photography in 1990 something. <laughs> um, this is the man who is really my, who inst started it all for me. I wouldn't be here today and I wouldn't have done what I've done in the last tw 20 years or so. And um, he was the person who really opened up a door in my mind that I didn't know was there, that I was creative. Um, he, he's an artist, but he taught on this art and design foundation course at Sunderland, where you do a bit of everything. And he was on the graphic section for three months you did that. And he um, just challenged us to uh, think of ideas. He showed me books of unusual inventions, like everyday objects with a clever twist, and then asked us, could we do it? And I found I did do it, and I, and I enjoyed doing it, and I've basically been doing it ever since. Um, and I recently found in the, off, in the loft, in the, the attic of my father's house, the first project I did, which Charlie Holmes, that guy, my inspiration, set us in the class. And it was basically to draw a line and make it interesting. So apply creativity to a line. And so this was the first uh, thing I did, really. It was um, This is a line that took a deep breath. And this is 
a straight line on a rest day. And this one is uh, the, a line that coughed. <coughs> and actually, this is a really simple thing, but it's really symbolic of everything I do ever since, which is if, you know, th this idea that if you can transform a simple line, like that is the most basic thing in the world, into something that makes many people uh, smile or laugh or react, um, then you can, you can literally apply creativity to anything. And, and what I do, um, in many ways, thinking about Mind the Gap, um, is what I really try to do is, I, I like to start low, like the everyday things around us, like a line or, or a, a cup of tea, or I like to start low, and then I like to make the biggest gap I can get to the final result. Is, is what I enjoy doing. So making this gap between the boring, the mundane, and transforming that into something surprising and interesting, that gap is what I'm tr attempting to do. That's the exciting part. Um, what's next? Oh, yeah, so I started to think of invention ideas. This is, I'll get out of the way, this is a name GPS for those who forget names in social situations. You are facing Tom turn left to face Claire. <coughs> this might be useful amongst us today. <laughs> um, and then I started to draw other ideas like, in England we like to queue up a lot, but I'm not sure it's the same here, I'm not sure. Um, so this is a headrest, um, um, just, to, uh, just to make it more comfortable when you're in England at the post office. Um, I so I, I'd started to look around at the everyday, like a fence. So we all know a fence, we've seen fences. And um, so this gave me the idea of a cost-saving five-plank fence, sensor detects position of person and moves the fence accordingly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna move on. Then I started to, uh, I went to Edinburgh College of Art in the graphic design section, but it was sort of very ideas-based. It wasn't technical, so I never really learned any skills. <laughs> but um, and I, then I did a postgraduate, and I could do whatever I wanted, and I turned some of my drawings, so that was a drawing, into real things. This was the first one, a bed. I think the idea was, when you're asleep, you don't really need the rest of the mattress. Um, <laughs> Now, I'm fast-forwarding now, so I have to go quickly. And um, I then went, I went to the Royal College of Art in London. I actually, no, before I did that, I left Edinburgh College of Art. I taught English in Japan for a year. So I was there for a year, and people say, Japan, it must be so inspiring. And, uh, but I never, I didn't have one creative idea in my whole time in Japan. <laughs> I think it was the culture shock. I was sort of on the defense. I was like this, oh my God. <laughs> and that isn't the best way to be creative. <laughs> you need to be the, op the, op the opposite of that. Anyway, I then went to the Royal College of Art in London on design products, um, led by a, a big famous designer, architect called Ron Arid. He was on the course. And I learned um, more about materials and finding ideas through experimentation with materials, not just in my sketchbook. Um, or on your computer, if you're not using your hands and making and uh, you know seeing the prototypes, you're actually restricting the um, possibilities of your ideas. I think. Anyway, I got into a bit of a creative block, and I did a project called Speed Creating, where I forced myself to make a create a creative thing every day for 30 days in a row, and photograph it and video it and put it on my blog. And this was one of the ideas that you're forcing yourself to have to come up with ideas. And I thought, I wonder what would happen if I put a little object on the hands of a watch, would it still work? So I tested it, then later developed that into, into this. This is oblivious iPhone user, elderly roller skater with a small child weightlifting and monkey on head, uh, goes by. This is adventures of this is a, a small child wrestling with a butcher. A 
a watch a watch sweeper. Thank you. I didn't see. And th these little glass domes were ver had to be very precise to get them to sit on the ridge of a watch. It's actually like half a millimetre. Um, this is a very sad one, actually. This is uh, the unrequited handshake. Uh, yes, sometimes I think they're going to shake hands. Um, <laughs> but no. <laughs> was that. Um, uh, this is a, a, a chair with a camera bag on the back, but actually it's a sheep. I don't know whether you see the sheep there. And I just show this because I, I was in my living room and I, and I had a camera bag, bag on the chair and I thought, that's a sheep. And it just, it just, you know, I just want to say that I believe that this, the mindset to, for, to be creative is to believe that everything that's around us, this thing, my shoes, the chair, the light, have got hundreds of ideas waiting to be found inside them. They're just waiting to be found. We've just got to look closer. So many people were, were walking past great ideas, potential ideas all the time, and I do it, and everybody does it. Um, one of the projects I, start, I did was uh, the world's first art exhibition for dogs. Uh, just imagine that in your mind. What would an exhibition for dogs be like? I had to think about this. What would a dog appreciate? Um, what would they not enjoy? And then I did these. Uh, so I first commissioned some artists to do some wall-based work. Um, dogs apparently can only see yellows and, and blues. So a little bit of serious research behind. Um, so this was a, 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 um, a chicken drumstick forest. <laughs> um, I made a giant dog ball with uh, fun ball pit balls that look like food. Um, this was an explosion of letters coming out of the letterbox that the artist said her dog goes crazy when the letters get posted. Uh, this is a simulation of the, uh, of the dog. <laughs> I'm going to stand over here for a change. Um, so actually, I, in, I researched it, and dogs stick the head, head out of the, um, the car window not just uh, for the breeze, but all of the scents, all the smells, hundreds of smells. And so in that fan there, I put some shelving, and that's a bit of meat and the fish and old socks. So the, fa the smells are being blown. And... Um <laughs> That was that. Now then, what is luxury? This is a project where I thought I wanted to do something about uh, what is valuable. So what is really valuable? What, so what is luxury? Actually, what is luxury was the name of an exhibition at the Victorian Albert Museum in London where I sh then showed this object. So I've sort of pinched their title. But thinking about what is valuable, we know money and you know, grand things and things we can buy. There's a value, but the, what, what's really valuable are things like, particularly when you get older, time, <laughs> or um, the anticipation of something. You know, that excitement, that anticipation of something is really valuable, it's enjoyable. And actually, the anticipation of something is normally <laughs> better than the actual thing. But um, So thinking about value, what is valuable? So. I, that's my nephew, Sebastian, in New Zealand. I visited him and he was skimming stones. And I collected some of these stones that I thought were really good skimming stones that bounce on the water. And I turned them into luxury skimming stones. So these were, um, so basically they are normal stones. And then I 24 karat gold leafed each of the stones and made these belt pouches in the shape of the, each of the stones that you could carry around. 
And um, I, I then wrote a little story just for myself, for my own interest, and um, of a person who is stand, who's been carrying around their golden skimming stone for 24 years, three months, two years, one day, and suddenly they're in front of like the perfect lake. This screen is the best uh, example of this story. And there, so I'm going to face the screen. Uh, so he's in front of this, the lake after all these years, and he's got this, this, this stone. And, 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 and he, decide, he knows that this is the moment. And this is symbolic, by the way, for all of the things you've held and you haven't done yet in your life. Um, and, and, and he unclasps the pouch, and he takes out the stone, and his hand is shaking. Because what if it just plops? What if it just, you know, what if? What if I could put it back and wait a bit longer? Or throw it. And then I stop the story there. <laughs> but I, um, I told this story um, at a, an event called the Do Lectures in, in, in Wales. And they have a publishing company. And they said, do you want to do that as a book? So I, that, this book is now out called The Skimming Stone. And then I teamed up with um, my friend and illustrator, Claire Mallison. And so that, that's, uh, that's on the internet. You can get that on Do, Do Books on the internet in England. That's just a little, little nice little book. And this is side signage rings to bring more attention to your engagement ring. <laughs> <laughs> this, looking back, you can get loads of ideas by looking to the past. You don't have to keep looking about the future and talking about what's happening now. There are thousands of years where people just like you were sitting wearing slightly different clothing, trying to think of ideas as well and making them so we can get inspiration from what they did. So this was a commission by Northamptonshire County Council in England, which is famous for shoemaking, traditional shoemaking. And they asked me to design a pair of shoes. And I didn't want to do just another pair of shoes. I wanted to do something in, uh, special. So um, I, took, I thought, what's the most special pair of shoes? Well, Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz, that film, and she clicks her heels together and she gets taken back to Kansas. And so I thought, could I do something like that, given modern technology? So I decided to work with a traditional shoemaker and a technologist to design um, the world's first pair of GPS shoes. And uh, so this was them there. And so these were the shoes, and you basically plot on a map where you want to go in the world. You press upload to shoes. Um, there's a sh GPS in the back. There's a transistor on the top there. This light moves around and points in the direction, and this is a progress bar that grows as you get closer to the destination. Um. <laughs> Uh, creative eye, yes. Um, so, when uh, to be creative, I think you've got to be like always on the lookout for ideas. You're not. It's not like a nine to five thing. I'm always like having it, talking to friends, walking down the street. Uh, this is an example. I got asked to create the, my vision for the future of mobility by um, Mini, the car, the car people, and Design, uh, the website. Uh, that, that was the challenge. So I said that in the year 2059, which was 100 years after the original little tiny Mini came out in 1959, it'll be safer to ride in a driverless car than in a human-driven car. About a year before that, I'd been visiting uh, Durham Cathedral in the northeast of England with my parents, and I was looking at the stained glass windows thinking, wow, they're amazing, but why do we not see it in contemporary design so much? Um, the two ideas came together um, and I decided to, to design a stained glass, driverless sleeper car of the future. So pushing the idea that cars will be super safe in the future, therefore we could just have a bed in them and go to sleep and be covered in beautiful stained glass, ha bringing together craft and um, modern. So I did a five-day workshop in how to do stained glass working, making. Those ladies in the back were on the same course as me, and uh, <laughs> making flowers and trees, and I was making this car, which was quite funny. Um, worked with Middlesex University on the frame, learned to do that. The actual stained glass took longer than five days. It took about a month. And um, then this was the car. Um, 
that's me going home uh, after the studio. Uh, it was shown in the design museum, outside of the design museum. Yeah. And that's me asleep in the car there. I'm going to get out of the way. And I, uh, thank you. <laughs> And Durham Cathedral saw all of the publicity and me talking about being inspired from my visit, so they invited me to show it in Durham Cathedral. So that was nice, a nice little full circle. Um, where are we? Right. Creative thinking is the connections we make between our knowledge, experience, and observations in new and surprising ways. I'm just trying to narrow it down a bit. Uh, it's difficult, you, you know, different definitions of creativity. What is creative? But it's nice to try and focus on it. So, actually, knowledge, experience, and observations are good. We need all of that to be creative, but it is the connections or the gaps, the jumping the gaps. That's the creative element. You apply the creativity using those things. Um, this is, uh, I just drew, I keep drawing this on long flights to <laughs> conferences. <laughs> um, so, this is day and night, and these represent ideas. And of course, during the day, we, we, we brush our teeth, we have a shower, we're having quick thoughts, quick ideas, but they're not very deep or big. Um, so these are the little ideas we've had, and we want to get our minds to be more like this. So jumping out of the norm, off this path, path that um, I am and um, we're all on, this sort of mind path, we need to get out over there. And children are brilliant at doing this naturally, so we can learn from children. Uh, so anyway, about three years ago, I did a project um, where I returned to um, my uh, home, uh, Sunderland, in the northeast, originally where I was at first inspired by Charlie Holmes. And, um, and I'd not done a project back there uh, uh, up until then. And uh, basically, I decided, ha had an idea to take children's ideas seriously. Right, so what, what I did was I asked 450 primary school children, so that's like 4 to 11, uh, to think up their own invention ideas. They could be bonkers or practical. There was no rules. I showed them some of mine. And then I asked local makers, manufacturers, designers, scientists to turn the best or most interesting ideas into real things for an ex exhibition. So I quickly did 19 workshops in two weeks in schools, asking children to draw their invention uh, drawings. And um, then I asked, I just put out a call for local makers to come along, and then they picked ones that they thought were the most interesting for them to, to make. And then the children that were selected met with the makers. <laughs> um, to explain their idea in more detail. So the, the children were the clients, really, and the maker was making what the child wanted. Uh, I, there was lots of empty shops in Sunderland because of the internet, <laughs> um, and I covered it in my drawings, and then we worked on an exhibition in the background, behind that in an empty shop. Uh, about a thousand people came to the exhibition, many people who'd never been to an exhibition before in their life. Um, because I think art and design can be a little bit intimidating words, but inventing is a fun and open word. Could be science, could be art, creativity, and, and we join them together. Um, um, some examples, this is Oliver, he went to my primary school coincidentally. He said when he's on his own and he, has n he does something good and he, he has no one to do a high five with, so he wanted a high five machine. Um, so, th so this high five machine w was made with a local fab lab. So they sc they, he went in there and he, they scanned in his hand. He press a button and it does that and he does a high five. He's very um, happy. Uh, this is Charlotte. Uh, children watch the news. Uh, she invented a war avoiding house. So it lifts the house out of the war zone, covered in um, uh, invisibility blanket. So I thought, well, how do we make that? So um, Erin here made this beautiful model of visualizing uh, the idea. And both of those were, and this one actually, I'll tell you, uh, this is a family scooter. Um, why Wendy? 
and it was made into this. <laughs> um, these objects were later taken into the permanent collection of the Victorian Albert Museum in London, which, which was uh, quite an impressive thing. Well, thank you, Wendy. <laughs> um, oh, that was just a little film. This is um, a Lego brick sorter. It's called a wind beam. What's a wind beam do? It makes the wind. And if it's all tidy, six arms will pop out, go through holes in the wall, and tidy up your room for you. And the retail would, I think, actually would quite be round about 100,000. This is what we give each of the children. And I've got a pile that big now and that's only five days and next week we're going to be seeing 300 children and of course each child does more than one so that could be like 400 500 <laughs> inventions it was 2000 mile an hour and it's got no brakes keeps ladybirds dry a really lovely idea was by sophia who's only age five and she came up with an umbrella to pr protect the ladybirds from the rain, which I thought was a hilarious and clever idea. And we went to the National Glass Centre, where Norman came out of retirement after 50 years of working in the glass works industry. And he made Sophia's idea right in front of her, and she was absolutely transfixed watching her imagination made real. You can't high-five anyone if no one's around, so uh, I invented the high-five machine. My hand's going to be printed in 3D, so it can go on the top of this. If you're sad, then it cheers you up. We've got a family scooter, which is a brilliant idea, because, you know, who wants to be scooting around by, the, by themselves? A bit lonely. I'm normally, like, you know, in control of every facet, but really I've just started the seed of this uh, project and now it's going off in surprising directions. <laughs> yeah. um, <clears throat> thank you. So this pro I then put it online and it went viral around the world and uh, we had television cameras visiting and in interviewing the children and um, I got asked to speak at the United Nations <laughs> about it. <laughs> um, <laughs> I love this photograph. <laughs> My friends really take the mickey out of me about this. Uh, what was it? Uh, yeah. Anyway, so uh, so we started to get lots of uh, emails about it and um, about wanting people in different places wanting to do the same thing. So we decided to do it as an ongoing project to so start it for a real thing. It was meant as a one-off, but it caught caught the imagination and it's called Little Inventors, and we have a website. We've got a website where basically children can upload, or parents or teachers can upload their inventions. We've now got like 7,000 or more, I think I, that's the last time I asked, 7,000 children's ideas on different subjects. Um, we then, uh, teachers, parents, um, organizations can download free um, sort of invention challenge workshop packs so we sort of give stuff away for free um, um, so for but w actually this was one of the ideas I was just looking last night have we got any from India uh, we've got six <laughs> I don't think it's been heard of here so I am introducing and welcoming you who know all the children <laughs> um, to tell them uh, so this little boy Abhinav from Bar Bareilly but really? Actually, he did all six, I looked. <laughs> so, Abhinav is your representative currently. <laughs> and this is that the invention will help us to stand or walk on water with the power of these, these blades underwater, which I think is actually a really good idea. And then we, we, we try to give positive feedback to as many of the children who upload as possible. And so... Uh, we think that your water shoes are a very clever I idea, especially clever that you've remembered to use a waterproof material for the shoes. Um, I would love to see them in action. Well done. And um, so we tried to give positive because confidence is so Im 
intrinsic to creativity. It's all about confidence, I think. The more confident a person is to be creative, the more, conf the more creative they will be. Now, a book is coming out in the middle of October called The Little Inventor's Handbook. Uh, you should be able to find it online, hopefully. Um, where I basically put all, uh, lots of ideas on how, uh, how to become an inventor. And, um, and so excited about that. that that's um, with uh, Harper Collins, so it's quite a big one. Um, what next? We've licensed to uh, China, to, to an organization in China, who are now going to remote villages and doing basically the s s same thing. Um, asking the children in China and the, the different styles of drawing is interesting on different countries and, and as it grows we'll be able to compare, uh, make more comparisons or make more connections actually through the internet between children in different schools in different places. Um, in China, they also do really big events in massive rooms um, with the exhibition of the made objects and the drawings and doing workshops. This is one of the Chinese ideas, which I thought was quite funny. This is a lollipop with a toothbrush in. So when you've finished eating your lollipop, you can brush your teeth. <laughs> Uh, we also teamed up with um, the Canadian um, National Science, Natural Science and um, Natural Science and Engineering Research Council, which is a big government um, initiative. They saw it and thought it was a great idea to encourage children to become inventors and uh, designers and creative. Um, and so we, they teamed us up with the Canadian Space Agency. So we asked children there in Canada to come up with inventions for life in space. And, um, and the best idea, we are told, is going to be shown in some form on the International Space Station. So that'd be good. Um, this was one of the ideas. That <coughs> I asked a, a company called uh, Atom Hawk, who do visuals for Hollywood movies, uh, uh, drawings. So the guy who drew this took like two days. Um, and basically, so I quite like it because he's really copied the red arms which is like this suit and um and the, and the colors and it's a girl who did it uh vera um and it's a girl in the in, in the um in the thing so so it's not just made objects and can be represented in other ways in in 2d um this is a recent exhibition <coughs> uh in in england in the northeast of england called the great exhibition of the north and this uh boy arthur who loves gardening and l wants to be a gardening television presenter. And uh, anyway, he came up with an idea of to keep this, the plants in the sun, it moves the plant on rails. So we worked with a, 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 a model railway company and they made this uh, little <coughs> thing called the Supergrow 11,000. <laughs> yeah, it's really nice, isn't it? <coughs> nice idea. And I'm coming to the end now. Um, yeah, in the, in the very first um, <coughs> exhibition, the first project in Sunderland, um, I had lots of, uh, like a recording device, audio, taking photographs, documenting it, video, to, because maybe someone might say some, some good idea. Anyway, there was a little girl tapped me on the knee and um, I looked down and, and she said something that is a really great inspiration for continuing and uh, doing this project and hopefully spreading it to the rest of the world, bringing it to India, hopefully. <laughs> um, <coughs> and she's, she said, now that I know that inventing is so much fun, see if you can understand the Sunderland accent. <laughs> Uh, now, now, that, now that I know how fun it is to invent, I want to be an inventor when I grow up. Oh, that's wonderful. I want to be an inventor when I grow up. So she wants to be an inventor which, and she grows up, which is great. Um, now, just back to Charlie Holmes, just as I finish, I couldn't find him. On, <laughs> he doesn't exist on the internet. So I, I'd lost contact um, for all this time. But then I got, uh, I got an award in Sunderland University to be uh, an honorary doctorate at Sunderland University. So I thought there was a ceremony and I thought, I must find Charlie Holmes who started it. And then I did find him. So, so that was, thank you.
And that's it. Thank you.